The life story of banker and philanthropist Edmund J. Safra is the subject of a new book by author Daniel Gross. Safra, a Sephardic Syrian Jew who grew up in Beirut and became the greatest banker of his generation, is also considered one of the top bankers in history. Here to talk more about a banker's journey, how Edmund Safra built a global financial empire, is author and financial journalist Daniel Gross. Hello and welcome. Hey, Molly, it's great to be here. And it's great to have you in Israel to talk about uh, your amazing book and, and, and work. And I first, let's start with, I know that your family originally comes from Aleppo. I imagine that's a, you know, a bit of a connection, but why write this book now, 25 years after his death, which I remember vividly as a reporter in New York when it happened. Right, so Edmund Safra lived from 1932 to 1999. As I say in the book, my wife told me I was born to write this book. I've spent my adult life as a financial journalist, working at the New York Times and Newsweek, covering global financial development. My last name is Gross, that's my father. Uh, my mother's family is Syrian. They have names like Nasser and Dweck, and we grew up around these people in Brooklyn. I knew my great-grandmother, who was born in Aleppo at about the same time that Edmund Safra's father was. So that connection, understanding not just what it is to be a banker, but also what it is to be a Syrian Jew, and how the two components of his life informed one another. That's the story of this man's life, and that's why I felt like I was kind of uniquely situated um, to tell the story. What makes, um, you know, his journey is so unique. I mean, I, I had a chance to read most of the book so far. I have to finish it. But um, he, so he had banking in generations before him and his family. But I find it interesting how his childhood kind of shaped him as well. Like his mother died in childbirth. He had so many, all these siblings. So he had this familial responsibility, business responsibility, and also, you know, carrying on sadika and everything and giving back. Yeah. So, the, you know, the Safras were one of the kind of leading families in Aleppo going back many generations. As they say, you know, we don't have aristocrats in that society like the Rothschilds, but they had the Safras. There were four brothers in the 1870s, and one went to Istanbul, one went to Alexandria, one went to Beirut, one stayed in Aleppo, so it was like a mini Rothschilds. Um, after World War I, Edmund Safra's father, Jacob, said, you know, things are kind of going south in, in Aleppo. Uh, I'm going to go to Beirut much more thriving economy, uh, a much younger kind of Jewish community. They hadn't, didn't have institutions, and the Safras there helped build the big synagogue, the schools, et cetera. That's where Edmund Safra was born in 1932 and where he grew up. And that, so he was a Beruti, but he was also a Halabi. He had kind of multiple identities, and they all kind of coexisted in this one person. Right. right. Explain why his Jewish values were so important. He wasn't just a guy wanting to build a bank and become a, a, a you know, a billionaire. He devoted his life to philanthropy building. Uh, I know he, he put money into some of the Sadi Kim in the north of Israel. Like, he was always, philanthropy was really, and Jewish values was always a foundation. Explain why. Yeah, and it operated on several levels. You know, he was born into a world of networks. There was the network of the Syrian Jews. There's the larger network of Sephardic Jews. There's the even larger network of Jews and then accompanying Israel. Um, as I said, they were one of the leading families. And in those communities, in Aleppo and Beirut, there were formal community councils like a president, secretary, who was in charge of what committee. And it was essentially like if you had money, there was effectively a tax. You were supposed to give according to your means to fund all the different organizations. When uh, the Jews left Syria and Beirut and those communities kind of fell apart where they were, he took it upon himself in the diaspora to be the guy that everybody went to. And so the book is full of stories and the archives that I had access to of I'm leaving Beirut, I need a job, okay, come work for me here. Uh, someone needs surgery, okay, I'll pay for it. Anywhere Jews were getting together to form a synagogue in Brazil, in Panama, in Brooklyn, and they didn't have you know, they weren't successful yet in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he was there to provide it. It was in the abs absence of formal institutions that he took it upon himself. He felt, you know, I was put on this planet to make money at a certain time and place. I had these talents to make money, and it's my responsibility to make sure that my community has dignity wherever it is. Right, right. Explain, I remember vividly uh, in 1999 being a new reporter in New York. It was a year where a lot of things happened, but I remember the fire, the tragic fire, and I remember being in Brooklyn, you know, where it was just Safra, Safra, Safra. Explain those circumstances around his death, especially like right after he sold his all of his banks to HSBC. Yeah. So, you know, the book is largely uh, a story of triumph. 
that he sort of traveled around the world and built these institutions and had an extremely uh, successful business career and gave all this money to philanthropy. But there are elements of tragedy in the story as well. One, he got Parkinson's disease in his early 60s, and that really kind of debilitated him and stopped him from being able to run this global empire that he had built. Uh, second, he didn't have his own biological children. And in his world, even though his banks were publicly held, every business was a family business. He couldn't figure out a way to involve his brother in the next generation. And the third was that he died prematurely. Uh, in 1999, he was in Monaco. Um, there was a male nurse who was on his staff um, who was maybe a little imbalanced and came up with the idea. He was insecure about his place sort of among the household staff. And he said, you know, I'm going to stage an attack. And I'm going to act like I fended it off. And then that'll secure my place here. And so he uh, sort of stabs himself with a knife put sandpaper on his face and said, there's an attack. He set a fire in the apartment to alert the first responders. And um, a chain of events happened whereby you know, Edmund was told there were intruders, and he refused to come out of the room where he was because he was concerned that there was someone in the building that might attack him, and he ended up dying of suffocation. Oh, incredible. Daniel Gross, we could go on and on, like a remarkable man, but everybody, I suggest you get the book because it really is such an interesting read. And thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your uh, your trip in Israel. Thanks so much. I know it's a pleasure you're uh, to be here. biking and having fun, too. Great. Thank you. Thank you.